Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. So good that you're tuning in either on YouTube or listening in on your favorite podcasting network. Do us a huge favor, always share or like these videos or podcasts. And we only take five-star reviews. Nothing more, nothing less. Five stars. Today we have my good friend, the second Tom of Calvary Bible Church, Thomas, in the booth. We're going to be talking about 1 Corinthians. But before we get there, do me a huge favor. Go to calvarybible.com. Click your campus. Find out what's happening in your neck of the woods. Stay connected. Get connected by going to calvarybible.com. There's so many great things happening this fall here at Calvary. I don't want you to miss out. So go to Calvary. Or download the Church Center app. That's a great place to listen to the weekly as well or submit a prayer request. Find out what's happening in your groups and how you are staying connected here at Calvary by the Church Center app. Now there's actually another way to give at calvarybible.com. You can also text to give. Find out more information about that. It's a wonderful new option here at Calvary. You can always put your offerings in the brown boxes in the back. Do they have those boxes in the back? In Boulder? Uh, yeah, I think so. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. We'll look next time we're there. We're, we will look like next time we're there. We got Thomas in the booth, like I said. It's been a fun intro already because I hit record earlier and muted Thomas. It's all good, Jay. It's all it's good. It's all good. I said so, the most profound things that I can't repeat again. Totally. You've had a busy week around here. You know, it's been a really great week. Uh, I think one of the things that's added to our plates is the parenting class. Jenny Fleetmeyer is doing an awesome job leading that with Cheryl, with the kids' areas. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, and now we have the Bucknums in, so Corner yes. Center of so, Parenting. Yeah, Dr. Bob and, and Gail are kind of our parenting gurus, so to speak, who are teaching the class. And they've rewritten a lot of their materials just to help parents in the present moment. And it's been really helpful, I think, for people. And in between the sessions on Monday night, we do a midweek cast, which answers some of the questions that came in from the evening's teaching. So we do a text in your questions. We try to capture as many as we can on the on Monday nights, but then the ones that we don't have time to get to or just want to expound on, we jump on the midweek cast. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. How are you personally connected to the Bucknams? I know that they've been a part of your life for a lot of seasons. Yeah, they're really good friends. Um, I had the joy of meeting them actually through their kids. So their boys were in student ministries when I was a youth minister, which was great. That was like youth ministry, early 2000s, Yeah, where now I'm assuming everything we did is illegal. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably true, actually. I well, was you a can't youth play those games then. anymore. Yeah. 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 So those were the good old days. <laughs> we walked to school uphill both ways with no shoes on but they got awesome boys that are all married they got grandkids now and it's fun to be be partnering with them on this parenting class yeah that's really cool so we're in the third week of the preach of first corinthians yeah here we go yeah what do you think so far how, what's what's the temperature in your world on how people are enjoying first corinthians well let's state the obvious we love the new pew bibles <laughs> everybody loves them yeah, that, the, that's been a great addition to the Erie campus. But I have actually really enjoyed the conversations around chapter one, specifically about Paul's really, I, I'm sure it's in other places, but his view of the cross is clearly communicated in chapter one of 1 Corinthians. Oh, yeah. It is saturated in that. And I, maybe yeah. outside of the book of Corinthians, this is my... His chapter on the cross, right? Would you say that? Well, you also, I mean, you have in 15 really talked about right. the resurrection, but I think what's fascinating is so much of it is based on the death of Jesus, whereas I think a lot of modern Christianity is based on the resurrection. Right. It's like that's the key point, which, I mean, obviously Paul picks it up in first, or not in first, in uh, Ephesians chapter one about the importance of the resurrection right. and the ascension of, of glory. But Paul makes such a big deal of what is accomplished in Christ's death right, on the cross. That's really good. You said 
this last week, the cross is the crossroads of all humanity. Yeah. You think it's too bold of a statement? Nope. I think you need to sort of share what you were talking about. I think it's really important for Christians to understand how actually history is written from a Christian perspective. Yeah. From the truest perspective of humanity, this is how it goes. It is amazing how, I mean, I really do actually believe that, that the cross is the crossroads, meaning like this is the intersecting point yep. of what all of humanity is going to be either directionally um, heading into or heading out of. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Thanks for putting it that way. Um, and so you look at all the history in the past is leading up to the cross. Yeah, and then totally. like where the future of humanity is going is based on the cross. People's opinions about their own life, about God, has to do with the cross. What we do with Jesus right. has to deal with the cross. Like every, All the conversations essentially come down to, what, what do you think about the cross of Jesus Christ? Yeah. Whether people know that or not, I don't think they do. Right. But that's essentially it. It is. It is the pinnacle of the human experience. Yeah. Even the thing about the world religions, they all have commentary on Jesus. Right. And I would say the vast majority, if not all, have a really positive view of Jesus. Yep. You know, your, your Muslim uh, friends, Hindu friends, like he's one of the gods, he's, he's a great prophet. Really positive, but once you start poking around saying, well, let's talk about the cross. Yeah. Let's talk about what was accomplished there. Who is who's being crucified? Then it's like, boom, division. Who allowed him to be crucified? Totally. So, yeah, I think this is the crossroads of all humanity, yeah. past, present, future. Totally. Now... You, you make a very important distinction, and we're going to get there in chapter 15. The resurrection is the central point, the validation of it all. Yeah, but there's victory in the death. Right. It's not just in the ascension. Mm. There's victory in the death mm. of what is being forgiven yeah. in what looks like losing is actually winning. Yeah. That's, that's, I mean, that's, these are parts of the argument that Paul is making here, where what looks like shameful, what looks like cursing, is actually God's victory plan. Yeah. You said it in chapter 1, verse 18. It says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. And you used the word uh, foolish and then said moronic. Yeah. And I think that's a really important word to capture in that folly word. How is the cross moronic to those? Yeah, I think it's the Greek word. It's not in front of me, but moros, which yep. we get our word moronic. Totally. So... Yeah, you think about how Paul says, you know, for for the whole world, and it's divided into two camps, Jews and Gentiles, right. Jews and Greeks. It's It appears really stupid. For the Jew, it's like, I can't even imagine Messiah, anointed one, right? right? This is in the line of David to sit at the throne of David, king of kings, lord of lords, prince of peace, dying? Right. That, that's just not a category. And then you know, cursed is the one that hangs on a tree. Yeah, which is Deuteronomy. Early, yeah. yeah, Deuteronomy. Early historic well, texts. Yeah. Of so our it's faith. like that's what's in their mind when they think of crucifixion. And then for the for the Greek, there's a lot of noble ways to die. Right. A lot of their heroes die, um, but not crucifixion. Crucifixion is what you do to publicly shame and embarrass someone. Right. And for the for the Gentile, you're thinking, how is Jesus more powerful than Rome? Rome put the guy to death. Right. Like why would we entrust ourselves to him? So it's foolishness both sides, folly. It looks moronic. It does. It does. And I think that the key there, though, is... But. Sorry, I was going to say the key. Yeah, go, go for it. But. But to us who are being saved is the power of God. Yeah. That's the key. This is the power of God that, that actually turns the whole world upside down. Mm -hmm. This is where the Christian now says, oh, the world and its wisdom and its power struggles in how it values life, people, all this stuff. It's like, it's through a different lens now. Right. It's through the lens of cross, of the, of the cross of Christ. Yeah. And it's interesting because the way Paul looks at humanity isn't Jew or Gentile. Like, that's not what divides people in and out of the family of God. No. It's those who are walking towards or walking away from the cross. Yeah. It's So I, I drew a little actually road that in my notes, that's sort of how I sort of mind map along yeah. with taking quotes. And I, I thought a lot about that. You're either walking towards or walking away from it. Now, I think it's hard for American Christians to understand the cross for several different reasons. Maybe you can help unpack Go that for, for us. One is we don't like losers. Mm -hmm. Our 
our American history is based upon winners. Like our founding fathers, we won against England. I make fun of that all the time with my English friends. You know, like we love winners. We love individuals who will go through the crucible and not give up and win, right? Yeah. We choose t- our teams by this. Our affiliation for teams come from like either parents or relationships or they won in a certain time period that was meaningful for us. Oh, for sure. I mean, like my fantasy football team right now? Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. So what are some other ways that Americans don't understand the cross based upon our, sort of our culture of the success-driven winning type mentality? Well, part of that is... Like we, what is the cross when you, when you, where do you see the cross today? And it's primarily jewelry jewelry, or what maybe a Christian bookstore or Christian company has like stamped with the cross. Right. So really it's affectionate in some way. Right. So when we see the cross, it's, it's a positive thing of like, oh, the cross of Christ. For the first century, the cross is the instrument of execution. <laughs> For... For criminals. Yeah, for right? criminals. And it's for not even shame. just for criminals. Like you, you could kill criminals in a lot of different ways. Oh, yeah. And they did. So in, in Corinth, there's actually, it's called the, the Bema. It's it's this uh, like post that you could bring someone in to judicial trial. You would then like chain them to it. Mm-hmm. And then you could put them to death there. Right. That, that's kind of almost like, yeah, you're, you're being guilty. We're going to do this in an honorable way. Right. The cross is something totally different. Right. The cross is... The, the lowest form of execution that's public. So it's, it's, people have tried to equate this to like the electric chair. Right. Even there, it's not public. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a pretty private experience of execution. Um, and that's maybe the normative way of, of how people are put to death in America. It's worse than that. I think... Um, I think French Revolution and the guillotine yeah. and throwing vegetables at the individual before they're... Yeah. Make it a spectacle of it. Exactly. For shameful purposes. Yeah. Co- James Coney, who is a, a an African-American writer on black theology, has a book called The Lynching Tree. Mm-hmm. And he really tries to draw the parallel between the cross and then how African-Americans were lynched in the U.S. And just the public humiliation, shame, mm-hmm. just awful. It's just so sick. And so, like, that's the emotion that's mm-hmm. that's probably being drawn out for this community of oh we got to boast in the cross what are you talking about right that's even, not jewelry that's not a, a rubber stamp that's not it wasn't even until the political success of christians of constantine that you don't even see crosses in art in the first right and that was because of was that a dream or a vision that he had of like conquering through the symbol of the cross right but and also like, more importantly like it was such a shameful thing that you wouldn't identify with it in a public way. The 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 seashell, the conch shell, or the fish were the early adopters yeah. of those symbols because they weren't a spectacle like the cross was. Yeah, so I think when it opens up in 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, it's like, yeah, that makes sense mm-hmm. because there's there's nothing about it that is attractional. And so... It does look like foolishness to boast in something like this. Mm-hmm. And I love, you know, so just notice this. We didn't have time to talk about it on Sunday. But really, this is present directional. Mm-hmm. So those who are perishing and then those who are being saved. So when you think oh, of... Oh, I didn't notice that. That's interesting. Yeah, so you think of like God is life. and would say that's heaven. To be separated from God is to be separated from life. That's death. Call it hell. The destination isn't just simply like we're all on one road and then like you figure out which which place you're at the very end. Is that we're currently on a path towards that destination. Mm-hmm. So you like the way I'm living right now is on the road towards perishing away from the cross, or I'm on a road of being saved. Now we could do a, a huge study at some point if we wanted to on the different ways in which the scriptures talk about you've been saved. Mm-hmm. You are, you are being saved, like here, and one day you will be saved. Yeah. Right? So it's not just something that just happened in the past. It's something that's happening right now that will be fulfilled fully in the future. But I think it's just important to remind ourselves, like, okay, this is actually, this is directional, and the direction is towards or away from the cross. And so that means people, 
could be coming to church, and there's a lot of people that are, who positionally seem to be really close to the cross. Like they're coming to church, they know their Bibles, maybe they're cultural Christians, but directionally they're living away from the cross. So geographical location, it's so like, oh, they're kind of Christian, but their heart and their attitude and, and what, they, what they are living after is actually away from the cross. They're actually perishing. Like you could be really, really close to all these things, but you're not facing it, pursuing it, loving it. And so you're, you know, it's almost at a disadvantage where you look at someone who's, you would say, look at their life. It's like a train wreck over there. Right. But man, they seem so far from what we would view as like Christian, mm -hmm. but man, they're so hungry for the Lord and directionally they've turned and they're moving towards the cross. And it still looks like their life's a mess, but positionally they're, they're moving towards life. Yeah. And they're like, the cross is not folly to me. I'm going after it. So I don't know if that, if that helps at all, but it's like, okay, wherever you are, whether your life's put together or not put together, that's not the point. But the cross isn't to make bad people good people. That's not, that's not even what we're doing at church. Right. What we're doing at church is making dead people alive people. And you could be really, really far away from life and experience a lot of death. But if you would just turn from there and start moving towards the cross from wherever that is, man, you're on the path to life. Yeah. So the question I had in my mind through this is why does God – want to use the cross as the decision point. Yeah. And he tells us, you quoted from Jeremiah 8 and Isaiah 29, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. The cross has to be the mechanism in which God chooses to have humanity really come into question if it's real or not right yeah the, or so, if it's true or not or if it's the way in which actually you are wise yeah i think that's that's the piece in verse 21 that's so important is that it pleased god through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe so this this decision of the son of god crucified in a way that causes some people, the Jews, to stumble and the Gentiles in other ways to stumble mm -hmm. is by design, and it's actually the pleasure of God to do it this way. Yeah, it says in verse 21, it pleased God. It pleases him. Yeah. And so there's so many things we just say, okay, hold on. Are we embarrassed of the gospel? Do we think the gospel is enough? Because it's not only the message, that's the cross, right? It pleased God through the folly of what we preach. So that's the message, the gospel, but what's the mechanism of preaching, of proclaiming this? And so that's how people are able to be saved, to have their eyes open, their ears turned on, is through the hearing of his message preached. The message is the gospel. The means of that is preaching. That's what pleases God to save the world. Now, why does he do it that way? To your point, Jeremiah 8 and Isaiah 29, is to actually frustrate and thwart human wisdom. Now, this mm. is not anti-intellectualism. This right. is not, okay, check your brain at the door, have faith, just believe, don't ask questions. No, that's not what's going on. What he's disarming is what human beings want to boast in, mm. is their own way, their own thinking, their own um, abilities. It's like apart from God, and it's always apart from God. So if you go to Romans chapter 1, this is the very thing that he is is recognizing is verse 18 says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Like they know it, but they're put they're, they're trying to like put a lid on it for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature can be clearly perceived. And this is this for although they knew God, they did not honor him or give him thanks but they became futile, futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And this is why they became fools because they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. So therefore God gave them up into this human wisdom, this natural man wisdom, and the whole world just falls apart now. And so Isaiah, when he's like, and Jeremiah, because you've rejected the word of God, I'm going to, I'm going to give you over to your wisdom, which is going to lead to destruction. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to frustrate you that the very thing you have to do to come back to me is humble yourself. Mm -hmm. 
surrender. So oh. what is so First Corinthians? What is he thwarting? Is the human boast. So the reason it pleases God to do it this way that the world would say, that's folly, that's stupid, I'm not going to believe that, I can't bring myself to believe that, is so that those who would believe would say, only God. Mm. Only God. So in verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Mm-hmm. Verse 31, so that as it's written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I love how you describe that this weekend of when you get to heaven, you're like, yeah, I made it. I knew what was going on the whole time, yeah. right? You're like, oh, yeah, I was smart. I I read these books. I got here. You're welcome. I'm here. I, I think it's amazing because oftentimes what gets you into a kind of like a club, so to speak, right, is your abilities to rise above, to esteem yourself higher, to exalt yourself higher, to prove yourself as a gold medal winner, right? right? And so what the Lord does in the cross, though, is he reverses the whole thing. And so what gets in the way of the cross is not your inabilities, Mm -hmm. but actually your pride. So what's in the way of human beings accepting the cross is themselves now. Mm -hmm. It's not where they're born. It's not their socioeconomic class. It's not what family name they have. None of that inhibits them from coming to Christ. Mm -hmm. It's not what you've done. It's not the the amount of sin that you've, you know, accumulated, accumulated in your life. The only thing that stands in the way between you and Jesus is your pride. And so those who boast in themselves, will not humble themselves, can't come to life because it's the way of the cross. And God doesn't say, well, look at this. It's like, you figure this out. You go, you go die to yourself. He says, I'll go first. Yeah, I'll go first. I go first. So like, I will model for you the way of the cross. God has always, I think that's one of the most unique things about our Christian faith is that our God doesn't demand things that he hasn't done himself. Yeah. He's, he, he went first. He goes first. He goes first. I also love that. Like, this is just the way that God loves to operate. Mm -hmm. Um, Zach did a great job on Thornton and, and Tom did a a great job in Boulder, just highlighting some of those episodes of how the Lord loves to use the things that the world looks like foolish and folly. So you think of King David, like he's the last son of Jesse to be thought of as King. God's like, that's my guy. Yeah. Uh, he loves to use Deborah mm-hmm. as a prophetess. It's like, yep, that's my gal. Uh, he loves to use even means of salvation. Think of like Naaman. He was this mighty Syrian general who needs to be healed from his leprosy. And the prophet Isaiah, or Elijah says, well, go wash yourself seven times in, in the Jordan. And Naaman's like, do you know how shameful that is? Like that's foolishness. We have, we have water in, in the area, we have cleaner water than this. Right. And it's, it's name and servant that says, if the prophet had asked you to do something mighty, like climb to the top of the mountain, slay the dragon, bring back, you know, whatever, would you not have done it? Why, what keeps you from this? And it's like, because it's so humbling. Mm-hmm. It looks foolish. He says, well, just, just go do it. Yeah. And he does it, and his healing comes. And that's just the image of the cross is, God, if, if God asks you to do something mighty, victorious, give your life, you know, like whatever, some mighty feat to get into heaven, we're like, yeah, I can do that. Mm-hmm. That's not it. That's not it. Okay, so turning the corner a little bit, I noticed a couple of words that spoke, so that stood out to me while I was looking at First Corinthians 1, and that's usually an indication that's important, Right. So I I think it's in verse 24, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks. Now in verse 26, actually 27, but God chose the foolish of the world. God chose the weak in the world to shame the strong. And then verse 28, God chose what is low and despised in the world to bring about things that are so that no human... This whole mechanism... Is about what God is choosing, mm-hmm. not we are choosing for God. Yeah, and you know, in those verses, like God chose what is foolish, God chose what is weak, low. Totally sounds like the beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, that's right. Blessed are those who are low in spirit. Yeah, weak. I think I, Jay, I think you just nailed it, man. It's like again, you come back to what is what does Jesus say is blessed. Who does Jesus say is blessed? Mm-hmm. And you go to the Beatitudes and it's like, 
goodness gracious, that's that's everybody the world says, I don't want to be like. Mm-hmm. Poor in spirit. No. I don't want to do that. But the hunger and thirst. Yeah. No, I don't want to do that. Yeah, meek. Who mourn. Yeah. Like, those are all things I'm trying to avoid. Right. Totally. And this kingdom says it's totally opposite. Yeah. I think it really gives hope. And this is where the podcast comes in. It's like it's land the plane. It really gives hope. Like if you are at the end of the rope, as Eugene says about the Sermon on the Mount, it's a great place to be because it's less of you and more of God. Yeah. If you are suffering right now, you're in the exact place which God can delight in because you're weak, right? I'm going to boast in the cross, right? That's what Paul says. That's why I'm going to boast in my weakness. Why? Right. Because then it makes much of what God's doing in my life. It's not about me. So again and again and again, it's like, who, who walks away from Jesus? It's the people that are threatened by him. They want to hold on to their power, want to hold on to their position, want to hold on to their possessions, want to hold on to everything this world says gives them power, gives them importance, gives them victory. And I was like, man, the kingdom is going to be different than that. It's not just for the good looking, the intellectual, the people that figured it out. Right. It's the ones that I've called. And I, I think you're right. Again and again, you have to come back to this is God initiated. Yeah, this is what God wants. What God's doing. I want to be part of what God's up to. Right. If you, yeah, if you want to do something God's way, then just pay attention to how he's going to do it. Yeah, how great was that from Bonhoeffer on Sunday? Where Bonhoeffer's like, if if I imagine who God is to be, and I determine where to meet God, I basically find the mirror of myself. Right, as the Greeks did that with them within Zeus and Apollo, and they put themselves in there. But if it's God who's the one that initiates, God who's the one that gets to call, God gets to be the one who chooses the plan of salvation, I meet him at the cross. Yeah, that is your choice. Yeah, there's no other way. There's no other way. It's interesting because we just need to pay attention to, I think, Paul, I think it's a great reminder for us to, like, have a robust view of the cross Mm -hmm. and remind ourselves daily, weekly, monthly, actually what the cross is for us. Because so easily we think about all the good things God does, like the resurrection, like all the amazing stories he does. And really it's in his losing that he wins. Yeah. And I think so many of us need to be reminded it is that story and that's enough. It's enough to trust that. And we don't need to add to it. We don't need to add more spectacular, yep. you know, I guess, I, I just imagine these these churches that are so bored with the gospel. that They're like, you know what we need to do? We need to add some pizzazz around here. Right. Because the gospel story of Jesus Christ crucified isn't enough. Yeah, it's a loser story. And it's like, no, that's actually the only story that gets people saved. Yeah, it's the only one. It's amazing. All right. Calvary, th- thanks for listening in to the conversation this week. Thomas, thanks for being in the booth once again, walking us through 1 Corinthians 1. Get prepared this next week. We're going to be reading 1 Corinthians 2. I would read the whole chapter to prepare yourself for Sunday morning. It's going to be a great uh, vision of what the Spirit does in our life, who the Spirit it. is. Yeah. And uh, you want to be prepared. So read chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians Besides that, let me leave you today with uh, sort of a vision for the good life this week, and that is in 2 Corinthians 2.15. says, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Remember, the aroma of Christ, we are the aroma of Christ, and that only comes from you and I looking more and more at the cross in knowing that it is God's mechanism for which we will be saved. Have a great week. Look forward to seeing you later, my friend.